Good evening, all of you, and once again, a very warm welcome to Algebra. We have a terrific lineup of speakers this evening, so I'm going to get right to it. Our first speaker for this evening is a young man who wears many hats, and they all, surprisingly, seem to fit him just fine. He is somebody who has uh, taken forward the legacies of both his mother, who's an activist and a writer, and his father, who's a tech entrepreneur. But he's also someone who's forging his own path, his own future, on his own terms. He started coding as a very young boy and went on to become an academic in the field of computer science. His PhD led to policy debates in the UK and the United States of America. He went on to teach at Harvard and at a very young age was inducted into the prestigious Harvard Society of uh, Fellows. And I believe when he was inducted, he was only the second computer scientist who, was, uh, who made it to the society, the first being Marvin Minsky, who some of you may have heard of as the father of artificial intelligence. However, in the last couple of years, he has veered away from academia to focus and to pay all his attention to his uh, tech startup which, uh, by my understanding, is all set to reinvent the wheel when it comes to artificial intelligence and automation. He and his team are doing some pretty groundbreaking work there, and I'm really looking forward to him talking to us about it to the extent that he can at this moment. But like I said in the beginning, he is a man who wears more than one hat. He's also the founder of the Murthy Classical Library, MCLI, which is committed to translating classical Indian texts from uh, many different uh, Indian languages, some of which are uh, now rarely spoken, into English with the original alongside so that generations to come might have access to Indian classical works in the same way that they have access to Western classical works. He's um, also working on a new project which is very nascent, but the broad idea is to build up a collection of art by women artists so that uh, connoisseurs of art and students of art might have the opportunity to experience and to study uh, the works of women who were not given their due by history. And uh, I believe there's also a um, third project that he is just about starting work on that he's yet to speak about, but I'm hoping we'll get him to speak about it a little bit. Uh, this evening. I have had uh, the pleasure of knowing our first speaker for a couple of years now and the thing that I admire the most about him really is his excitement and his curiosity about the world around him. It is truly infectious and his ability to be able to think about the world around him in a way that transcends silos of ideology, of disciplines, and of subject matters. Please welcome Rohan Murthy. Hi, Rohan. Hi, hi, Pratia. Thank you for joining us. So, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> okay. Okay, so like I was saying, you are somebody who does a bunch of things. And I think more importantly, you're somebody who is interested in a, a, a whole lot of things, motivated by a whole lot of things. In this age of super, super specialization, what inspires you to look beyond your immediate field of study constantly? And what would you say are the upsides of being a polymath? First, I won't claim to be a polymath, uh, but... What would you claim? An aspiring polymath? I would claim I'm attempting to be a renaissance man. Uh, but um, Wow, I should have just said that in my introduction, I saved a lot of time. I'm attempting. Um, no, I, 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 I'm not unique in this regard in that I'm very curious about many things. I grew up being devoted to science, to mathematics, to engineering, to, to computer science. Um, I had the, mis the, the fortune of making uh, friends who did very different things for me, who were philosophers, who were uh, political scientists or economists or anthropologists. And I was very curious how they spent their time, much like how I spent my time. And I learned from them, and that really led to 
from one thing to another during graduate school and later on, to being able to connect, uh, make connections between different disciplines and different parts of knowledge. And that's really uh, where my interest lies. So I'm very interested in philosophy, very interested in history, very interested in, in my own discipline, of course. Um, and there's nothing that I, you know, I wouldn't want to learn about. Um, and, and there's some joy in learning about things. Right? It's as simple as that. Yeah, I can vouch for that. Um, you know, you've spoken a fair deal about what motivated you to start the multi-classical library, and a lot of those interviews of uh, Rowan uh, are online. So I'm not going to ask you to delve into it in too much detail, but for those in the audience who might not be familiar with the project, could you just quickly recount what the project is, what motivated you to start it, and what you aim to do with it? Sure. So um, this is a hundred year, well, we, if the future plays out right, for the next hundred years at least, uh, what we are aiming to do is to take literature from um, about 14 different Indian classical languages, right? So Sanskrit, of course, being the obvious one. My mother tongue is Kannada. I speak and read and write contemporary Kannada, but you have old Kannada, or are you saying Kannada, Hari Kannada, or old Tamil, medieval Marathi, medieval Banga, etc., etc. So take literature from these languages um, and translate them and in a sense make them more accessible to people across the country in India to a large extent even preserve them. That's really in this case the purpose of translation um, and to celebrate these classics. Um, you know, if we get some time we talk about some of these classics um, in India and also abroad as well. We want to expose to the world. Usually when you go into a classics department anywhere certainly in the United States, um, and you say the word classics, people think of Greek and Latin, you know, with, which are great, but we also want to, sh want to showcase the extraordinary intellectual history of, of India, or ancient India, uh, through literature. And so our goal is every year, uh, four to five new volumes, we should, you know, we translate when you open these books. Um, I, I noticed somebody in the introduction said that, um, uh, you know, Venki and Chitra's books are outside. Um, I, I didn't know we could bring books. Um, you can look us online. Uh, we have 21 volumes uh, on Flipkart and Amazon. We are a non-profit. Our goal is really to spread the message of Indian classics being first-class citizens. Um, and so, yeah, we, are, we have today done about 21 different volumes, um, eight languages, um, uh, actually, sorry, nine languages. Uh, an example of the kind of text we have translated are, uh, there's a Pali text, um, the Terigatha, which is, I believe, the oldest poetry written by women anywhere that is still accessible to mankind. So the original script is in Pali, uh, which you see on the left-hand side when you open our books. And on the right-hand side is a very high-quality scholarly translation done by one of the best-known scholars alive for this variant of Pali. It's Pali in a Burmese script. Uh, and the, the Terigatha is about the stories and poems of the first Buddhist nuns and, and how they became nuns. And it's from about 200 BC. And so it's about 22, you know, 2,200 year old text. Uh, we have translated our first Kannada text, is medieval Kannada text from um, uh, Harish Chandra's, um, uh, Raghavanka's Harish Chandra. We have Sanskrit texts, we have done all of, most of um, uh, Ramcharit Manas, Tulsidas Ramcharit Manas. Uh, we have the cornerstone of Sindhi poetry, Risalo, which we translated for the first time last year. Uh, we have four new volumes that have just come out. Um, as well. So every January, four to five new volumes, and this is what we're trying to do. So my personal favorite is the Terigata, and uh, you know he he mentioned that uh, it's uh, poetry by um, Buddhist nuns, but it's it's really just it's it's a lot more than that because these women are writing about their inner lives, about thoughts they're thinking, about their sexuality, about what goes on around them, about men in their lives, you know, just about everything. And there's humor in it, and there's philosophy in it, and it's just such a revelation. Could you pick a favorite text if you had to out of the twenty-one volumes? Risalo, which I didn't, I, I'll admit, I did not know of its existence until the book actually came. Um, I, I can see that. And, it's, and the translation is actually done by a gentleman um, who's an extraordinary scholar living in London. He's quite old now. Um, and he tells me the story of how he actually learned about these Indian languages because he couldn't get any job and he's a good scholar. So he read in the papers that maybe if he learns Indian languages 
an LSC or one of these places, he could become a tutor. And then he turns out to have become one of the ex extraordinary scholars. And so he's translated it, Christopher Shackle. Okay, very quickly, uh, Rohan, you know, there's a wealth of material for you to mine, and you uh, guys are picking some of the finest texts. Uh, the translations are wonderful. Uh, I'm really, I'm not just saying this because Rohan is sitting here. It's really unfortunate that we don't have MCLI books out there tonight. Uh, but please go look them up online and uh, buy at least a couple of them and read them. They just, they will surprise you, I promise you. Money back guarantee, you know where to find me. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it, the translations are wonderful and um, uh, the diversity is just incredible. Uh, but, and I know they're available online and they're available in stores and I believe uh, they're also part of coursework in uh, some coursework at least in, in Harvard, is that, is that correct? Oh, several US universities now. Ah, okay. uh, if you're an undergraduate student, by default, in addition to Greek and Latin, you will read about Indian classics. So that's great, right? I mean, your own, your fundamental definition of what is a classic you know, um, I wish I could say that we've had that kind of success in India, but not yet. But perhaps in time. Well, it's a hundred year project, so. <laughs> yeah, but we hope to have more impact in India sooner than later. I mean, I'll I, I just add why. I, I think India is the ultimate place to have impact on this. Um, again, my experience is not unique. I was born and raised here in Bangalore. I went to school here, Bishop Hartman Boys. Um, you know, ICSC, ISC, Central Syllabus. Um, in school, we read Shakespeare. We read Merchant of Venice for two years, which is deeply painful. We read Hamlet. Actually, Merchant of Venice, okay, Hamlet for two years. That was deeply painful. We read Charles Dickens. Um, I remember we read uh, uh, Walt Whitman's Oh, Captain, My Captain, you know, Our Fearful Trip is Done, and so on. It's the, the, the metaphor for the American Civil War. And actually, most of us didn't know who Abraham Lincoln was uh, in school. And we certainly didn't know what a civil war was because India has not had a civil war. So it was a very strange foreign context, and yet we read it, uh, and we got tested on it, and our teachers asked lots of questions about it, and our teachers also didn't really know enough about it. Um, and then we read um, Ulysses, um, uh, James Joyce, uh, you know, to strive to seek, to find, never to yield, which was also great, but extremely foreign context. Again, when I remember when we were reading in the school, we used to call it Isaka, because again, we don't know what this Ithaca thing is. Um, and this idea that somebody's limbs are being taken off and we, all of us are speaking Kannada in school wondering why are they taking off limbs. Very, very strange. But my point is that we accepted all of that. We read it. We have to understand it. We have to celebrate it. We have to take exams on it. And yet, we didn't read one single text that's through the Indian classics. Now, after 60, 50, 60, 70 years of independence, this strikes me as incredibly weird. How can it be that after 50 years of independence, yes, you can blame the English and so on, maybe after 47 or maybe 57, 67, but I'm talking about this like 2001 when I was finishing school. That seems to me is very strange. And I'm not alone or unique in this. Of course, I think if you study the state syllabi, it's probably a little bit more balanced. But in the central syllabi, you learn next to nothing. And so when I landed up in college at Cornell, I had French and German friends talking about their great classics, which are frankly, you know, 300, 400 year old books. Nothing wrong with them, but at the same time, I knew nothing. Somebody asked me, tell me 10 great Indian classics, and I didn't know. And again, my experience is not unique. So therefore, to me, the ultimate impact to have with these kinds of books is, again, not to force it down anybody's throat, but to provide these books as an option. So maybe, you know, you'll read some Shakespeare, maybe you'll read some Kalidasa, you'll read, uh, uh, I don't know if Telegas has for school children, but certainly maybe Risalo or Raghavankar's Harish Chandra and so on. And then you'll also read Charles Dickens and these other things too. But there's no balance today. I mean, it's completely strange. No, you're absolutely right. And that's about to change. And may your tribe increase. I think you, there's somebody out there uh, saying that you need to hold your mic closer. I need to hold my mic closer. Or we, we both just hold our mic closer. I need to be louder, yeah? Yeah, you need to oh, be louder. Yeah. That's, that's, that's never a problem. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's the right volume. Okay, okay so, um, a brand new project, uh, a brand new idea that's growing in your head, and how does it bring mathematics and poetry together? How much time do we have? We have all evening. I mean, they told me we have to get out of here in 30 minutes, but uh, I'll see how they drive us up. So, okay. So, uh, I, I hope and I trust most of you here have heard of my friend uh, Manjul Bhargava, uh, who's an extraordinary person, a very kind person. And, and an extraordinary mathematician, the first 
sort of um, a few, you know, fields medalist, one of the fields medal in 2014 um, um, in mathematics, of course. And, and really, my interest in, in, you know, I was already interested in all these classics and all these other things, and that's why I met Manjul. And Manjul is a professor of mathematics at Princeton, and he's very interested in Sanskrit and mathematics. And so he started sort of walking me through and talking to me about um, mathematics done in this part of the, of the world 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And it was all fascinating. Um, and in fact, you know, one thing led to another, and there's this long journey that I'll really compress down the journey of discovery. And, and here, I mean, I'll summarize it. Here's the amazing thing that, that should completely shock every one of us. 2,000 years ago, if, or 2,500 years ago, if you lived in this part of the world, there was no real difference between a poet and a mathematician. The lingua franca for expressing mathematical ideas was poetry. Now, apart from a brief period in Greek history, I don't know of any other civilization that has ever achieved this extraordinary expression of ideas. At least to me, it's, 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 it's very different from how I or anybody I know have learned mathematics in school or in college and so on. Which works for some people, but I think for a majority of people, it's extremely inaccessible, or it becomes inaccessible eventually. Um, and so Manjul and I did some experiments where we once, you know, we just said mathematics lecture on poetry and Sanskrit. We had 900 school children show up in Bangalore. The only time I know so many school children or anybody really assembled together is when you have a cricket star or a business person in a room. Nobody really shows up, or maybe a Bollywood person. But to listen to a lecture on mathematics and Sanskrit, and it was an incredible audience, and the kids were all jumping up and down, and we were showing them examples of, poet, of Sanskrit poetry, which are very, very accessible, um, and how mathematics was embedded in these poets. Um, imagine a theorem expressed purely in poetry form. In fact, the world's first quadratic equation, which Aryabhatta um, uh, wrote about is, is, is about the journey of a little bee that goes from one flower to another. And you know, it's this poem of the bee's journey. And by the time you're done with it, essentially Aryabhatta has described to you a quadratic equation. Okay. Um, and, and, and this, again, you know, we, when we show kids all these things, these kids, I mean, these were, there was probably six standard to eight standard and their teachers and parents and everybody were jumping up and down. Um, and the reaction we got was so positive, and that's when we felt, hey, maybe there's something to this. The idea that you can access mathematical knowledge, uh, now I don't want to say that you can, you can become a great mathematician only through poetry, I'm not making that claim. But certainly I think um, there is an opportunity for enhancing mathematics education across the globe, certainly in India, but not just in India, everywhere, using Sanskrit poetry as the means. And again, this is something that I'm willing to bet perhaps most people in this room, again, it's not characteristic of this room, I think it's characteristic of modern Indian population, we're not aware of. Um, and so my goal with this next project is to bring to light a compendium with an with a exposition of information that will make accessible to people these extraordinary poems and the mathematics hidden in them and hopefully make it more fun for people to learn mathematics. It's still early days, early days. What I find absolutely fascinating about this, uh, very quickly, is of course we not just did not, growing up, did not know this, but we also grew up with this sort of myth, uh, which I don't think is, is unique to India, that you know, you're either interested in arts or you're interested in, either you have a brain that is inclined towards the arts and poetry and, and, and what have you, or you have a mathematical brain. And I was one of those people who was brainwashed into believing that. And I just, uh, even though I was a science student, I you know, just firmly believe that I wasn't cut out for mathematics until I started studying econometrics in university and I realized that it was all just, you know, I can't use unparliamentary language, but humbug, is that parliamentary language? But, you know, you get the drift. And when I found out about this, and the first time I heard about it was from Rohan, and I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is great. Just for people <coughs> to know that just because you like poetry doesn't mean that you will not be able to master mathematics. In fact, it's quite the contrary. Rowan, moving on to, uh, you know, the tech startup that you're working on. The first question I really wanted to ask you uh, is that uh, you're, uh, you're one of the youngest members, or at least you were when you were inducted into the Harvard Society of Fellows. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the current president, or at least the former president, was also somebody who used to be an academic and then became an entrepreneur. Is that correct? I forget his name. Oh, the, the current chairman, yeah. His name is Wally Gilbert. Okay. Um, uh, Wally is... Um, 
he won the Nobel in 1918 chemistry and then he also was the first founder and then the CEO yeah. of Biogen, which is today a $70 billion market cap company. So as far as, uh, to my limited knowledge, he's the only entrepreneur slash science slash Nobel laureate. He's still the chairman right now. Okay, okay, great. I was wondering if he motivated you in any way or, I mean, did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? What made you decide to make this switch from being a, an almost full-time academic to being a full-time entrepreneur that you are right now? Well, you're not full-time anything, but you know, as full-time as you can be. <laughs> I'm a full-time human being, but... Uh, no, I, I, no, actually, uh, Pragya, I don't draw these distinctions. Uh, I'll tell you why. So if you're an academic, you start an assistant professor, you have to fundraise. You have to, that means you have to convince somebody to give you money for your ideas. Then you have to run your lab, you have to recruit students, you have to keep them motivated, enthusiastic, produce output, then go convince somebody else that, okay, this money was well spent, so I need more money. This is exactly the pattern that any entrepreneur would follow too. Right? Um, and so, in, to a certain extent, of course, there are differences, but to a certain extent, I, I, I don't draw that kind of distinction. And no, and my interest in so on had nothing to do with quality. It was just my own journey. I was an academic and I was very happy doing my academic work. And along the way, I accidentally bumped into an idea that I got very excited by. And I called a bunch of my other academic friends and they said, oh, let's go build this. We weren't sure if it would work. And I was writing code and it started to work. And then I called a few more people and a few more people came over. And eventually I just, I found I couldn't do two jobs at the same time. I couldn't do my academic work and run a company. And so I quit being an academic to run the company. That's all there is to it. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've sufficiently whetted the appetite of the audience. Could you just tell us a little bit about what it is that you're working on? Um, I, in my introduction, briefly said that it has something to do with AI and automation in the hope that you will tell the audience a little bit more on what exactly is the nature of challenge or challenges rather that you've taken on with this project. So I jokingly tell my father that if the organization that he built, at Infosys, they do something with 100 people, we do it with one. Okay. Maybe one day it'll not be a joke. I don't um, but really what we are doing is um, we are building technology that, um, that lets us go to various companies and ask the questions of is your human potential or talent being utilized the best way possible or not? Because the most common pattern that at least I have seen thus far across all companies is you have people who are very capable, very experienced, very intelligent, but often stuck doing things that it's very clear today that a machine can do better. Um, and this is not a good use of human potential. And whenever we talk to all these large companies, if I say you talk to an Amazon, they, they tell us, saying, hey, we actually have so much more we'd like to do with our people, but we're stuck doing all these other things. So it's about how do you identify areas where there's human potential that's misallocated? Um, how do you do it automatically, for example? Uh, how do you very quickly and automatically find areas where humans are doing things that machines can do better? How do you then get machines to do it? How do you do that quickly? How do you automate it? And then how do you elevate human effort to doing other things? So that is the very high level, so 100,000 feet view. Um, we have built a lot of proprietary IP technology that lets us do this at a certain scale and a certain way um, that we believe nobody's done before. Okay, so, um, you know, it's interesting that you say this because in a sense, the first so-called computers were really just people, largely women. And what I mean by that is that uh, rudimentary first generation computers, they essentially started doing work that human beings were doing before them. And in a sense, the journey of uh, the evolution of computing has been exactly this, right? Which is to um, get machines to take over redundant, deterministic sort of mental work done by human beings. Where, you know, the innovation that you plan to bring to the table or are bringing to the table, would you say that this could be, has, this has the potential to be the next frontier in this journey, at least in its ambition? No, I would always hesitate to say that it's at the frontier and it will break new ground, and so I don't say that. All that I'll say is, um, to a reasonable extent, we are taking the automation argument to a logical end conclusion in the enterprise. We are asking questions like, can a machine run your department? Can a machine take a lot of your critical decisions? Can your company ultimately be run by machines? 
That's the kind of questions we ask. Sorry, I think I'll rephrase my question. I, I you know, I, I know how uh, uh, bold you are to kind of uh, play up anything that you're doing or working on. But I, I guess what I was trying to ask is that, is what you're trying to do incremental or is it sort of disruptive? And I don't think one is lesser than the other in, in any way. Sometimes just that one incremental step can also you know, be a revolution and sometimes disruption can also be worth nothing. So I mean, it's, it's not, I, I, I was just trying to get a sense of how radically different it is from what is going on at this point in time. Well, you know, my colleagues and I are doing this because we believe we are beyond incremental, but eventually time will tell. If we thought we were doing something incremental, I don't know if we would be doing it. Or at least by our own lens. You know, that that's exactly, our, our what, our that's exactly what I was trying to uh, yeah. But yeah. that's true for anybody who's running any company. Nobody will tell you saying, I'm doing something incremental and I'm so excited. I'm staying awake all night doing something incremental. I'm going to go hire all these people and people are going to give me money to do something yeah, incremental. It would be very unfair. A lot of people, actually, most of the people in this world who do incremental work. Well, oh, it's probably true for us too. But I'm saying the belief that you have, at least, you know, it's like the folly of youth in a young company and you think, ah, we are changing the world and maybe 10 years later you realize, hmm, you did. Yeah. So we'll see. Folly of youth, Rohan, you're not. Not young anymore. But, uh, <laughs> I was laughing to myself. I was giving you the compliment. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know there may be maybe I know it's Bangalore, but it's, it's the possibility that there are non techies in this room. So um, I just I, I want to get a sense of the real world implications of say if I am a, a company or an industry and I embrace the technology that you're bringing to us, um, how does it have the potential to impact growth, to impact jobs, to uh, the future of jobs in the company, uh, efficiency and, uh, uh, you know, uh, of course productivity, which is key in the end. I think the truth is nobody knows. Uh, and I firmly believe... Are you selling uh, your uh, stuff by saying nobody knows? No, no that's not what I mean. I, I, because your question, I'm being very precise, your question is about the future or what will happen to jobs and people and society. I, I mean, I understand the vector. And for anybody who pretends to know, I don't believe them. Um, and here's why. So if you were to talk to, uh, you know, if you go back to the turn of the 20th century and you look at the number of horse carriages in New York City, was the world's leading market for, uh, actually New York and London, for horse carriages. And therefore, by extension, not just horse carriages, for horses, people to look after horses, for people to shovel dung out from the streets because the horses were, you know, messing up everything and so on. It's a whole person industry. Now, with the introduction of the first car, if somebody were to say, this is how you know, create more jobs in the horse carriages and your society will change, I think it's very, very hard to, to kind of predict what has happened today or hundred years ago. So I would hesitate to make that kind of prognostication, but I think there are certain facts. The facts are, in the, in the history of the Industrial Revolution, every time there has been a significant step up in terms of productivity, there is there's no such thing as law of conservation of jobs. There have been, to a certain extent, net reduction in jobs for a certain period of time. And maybe over longer periods, I, this I don't know, I don't have data, so I'd be more hesitant to make this way, maybe over longer periods, it recovers from but the, we have seen this pattern of sort of a significant increase in productivity happen. We've seen this when cars were introduced, or the motor vehicle was introduced. We've seen this actually when the first automated hand loom was introduced uh, about 300 years ago. It's the same, same thing. We've seen this when computers were introduced um, as well. And so I think what you, we will see, we are seeing and we'll continue to see is yet another step up thanks to software. Um, but I, I still, I hesitate to say, you know, to talk only of the ill effects of what happened or to talk only positively. I, I hesitate to say it'll create more jobs, I don't know. I also hesitate to say it'll take away everything and then people will not have any jobs and so on. I hesitate to say that as well. Because Fair enough. this has been 360 years of history. We have seen this time and time and time again. Fair enough. Um, one of the things that I believe uh, your uh, venture advocates is a uh, holistic adoption of automation over piecemeal automation. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Wait, how do you know this? <laughs> I'm very impressed. Corporate espionage. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Um, 
Yeah, no, actually we always start with the first question. We start with the question of, um, so, you know, we were talking to, uh, a few years ago, we were talking to a very large Fortune 500 company, and they said, look, all this automation stuff is great, and all this tech, but we want to understand what are our people doing? Are they doing work that truly humans must do? Or are they doing work that machines must do? Or even if it's work that humans must do, are they doing it the right way? Is there a lot of inefficiency there? So I asked them, okay, how do you answer this question today? And they said, oh, you know, we hired McKinsey and BCG and so on. And perhaps, you know, being in graduate school for too long and so on, somehow the people say consulting company, we all get a little irritated. We don't think they add value. Not true, but we have these kind of biased notions. And so we said, oh man, you know, what do these guys know, you know, about technology? Can they tell the difference between, jokingly, a potato chip and a computer chip? You know, how can they tell you what, you know, um, what humans should do or what machines should do. And we are techies, we can tell you better. And so this then led to another discussion where we realized, actually using a lot of ideas from you know, an artifact of artificial intelligence called neural networks, we can actually begin to solve the same problem. So what if we had a machine that observed what people did on their, on their machines, you know, day in and day out for two months? Could we now reverse engineer everything they were doing by mere visual observation of what they did? That's a hard problem. Um, and so we realize that actually this is hard and difficult, but if we can begin to solve this problem, we'll give people a quantifiable way to understand what their people are doing and how they can get them to do better things. And that's really how it started. So it started from there to, okay, now that we've figured out what people are doing, what machines should do, and what humans are doing, and we'll build software to automate even this act. In other words, we're automating the act of figuring out what to automate. <laughs> then we said, oh, we now have to build a machine that will actually do the same work that the human is doing. Can we even automate the act of building that automation system? Okay. And, and so you don't understand what he's talking about? Go home and watch Inception. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, but, Rohan, it's, it's interesting. Obviously you don't, you know, you don't believe uh, that you're doing incremental work. I don't believe that you're doing incremental work. But in order not to do something that's incremental in the area of AI and automation, I think one of the things that you might have to convince companies is that people can trust machines in the way that they trust human beings. I don't know if they really trust human beings, but I feel like they feel they can hold human beings accountable. They can pull them by their ears or you know, threaten them or, or what have you, or call up their parents or whatever, you know, whatever it is that people do to hold other human beings accountable. So this idea, that machines can be held accountable, machines can be trusted. Fundamentally, is this something that you found easy to explain when you go have conversations with your clients? Because I know that you are involved to some extent, at least in, in sort of sales and pitching, etc. You absolutely have taken our deck out at this point. I, I'm all credit to you, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, because you hit the nail on the head. Um, you hit the nail on the head. Because here's the thing, as a computer scientist, I think, um, not just myself, all my colleagues uh, now, to a limited extent, you're kind of bred to believe in the superiority of silicon over carbon, that means machines over people. And the very first time that I really appreciated, no, actually it's not that simple, what every individual brings to the table was, you know, when we were trying to build software that could mimic what humans was doing. And let's say you, in any one of your, you know, wherever you work or whatever you do, let's take a simple example. Somebody who's processing payroll, it's very age-old practice. There's software to do this. People are doing this. Um, it's a, you know, you, often people say, oh, this is very simple. You know, anyone can do this. You don't need to be a specialist to do this kind of a job. Well, if you want a machine to be able to do the same job as a person is doing processing payroll, let's say I'm processing payroll, and you give me a paycheck to process for a billion dollars, you know, in a month as salary to someone. Straight away, thanks to sort of my, you know, some sort of training or common sense or societal information, I'll know that nobody gets paid a billion dollars a month, even in a bank, in a Wall Street bank. Um, and so I'll say, okay, there's something strange here. I'll go talk to someone, or at least that's what you should expect of me. So I have, you know, layers of common sense. Granted, some have more than others, but nonetheless, there is common sense. Or if I make a mistake, you can come and ask me, why did you do this versus this other thing? You can ask me counterfactuals. If you did not do this, then what would have happened? And I can actually reason, I can talk to you about these things. In fact, it is all these other facets, these other layers that actually create trust between you and I. 
In fact, if I were just a person who just clicked and typed all day long, which is how most people think of these kinds of jobs, they think, oh, they're just clicking and typing. It's never that simple. Because in addition to that click, yes, I am clicking and typing, I'm doing all of those boring bits, but I also have these additional facets and layers in my head that create trust between us. I'm accountable, I can explain. And so when we start thinking of building software to automate what a person is doing that we think a machine can do well, if you were to imagine just replace the clicking and typing, but not the other layers of the common sense and the explaining and so on, it's like you took a person who had all these, who could speak, who could hear, who had a brain and so on, and replaced them with someone who could not speak, who could not hear, who could not, you know, who had no brain, who had no common sense, nothing, who just clicked and typed all day long. By definition, such a person doesn't exist. And you would also not hire such a person. And so the, the struggle is when you think of, when anyone thinks of automation, you should hold software to the same bar, to the same standard that you hold a human, and that is hard. It's hard from a technical perspective because software is not that evolved. How high can that bar go? Um, uh, you know, we spoke about trust and accountability, but, and again, this is not something you might be able to predict right now, but I still want to put the question to you. There's also socio-cultural specificities, you know. Uh, there is what we call the elusive human touch, human discretion. How high can the bar go? If not now, then in the future. Um, I, I think in a general sense, I hesitate to uh, speculate how high the bar can go because, you know, that I don't think anybody knows. But I think if you pick specific instances, let's say you, you narrow it down to the industry or to a specific kinds of use cases, you can actually do a reasonable job. And you need a little bit of, sort of, you need to invent a few things and so on, but, you know, we're found we can solve problems in a, in a limited scope. Okay, I have to ask this. Um, a lot of people have, um, and perhaps justifiably so, anxieties about uh, the dark side, the potential dark side of this brave new world of AI. Definitely everybody who's, a, who's watched Black Mirror, I'm pretty sure at least some people in this audience have watched Black Mirror. Do you watch Black Mirror? No, isn't that a movie about a ballet dancer? <laughs> <laughs> I let's, clearly don't. Let's, let's, stop, let's stop later. Well, that's okay. the next one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, uh, which is also dark, but... Uh, uh, doesn't quite talk about AI. Actually, it does talk about AI. Anyway, uh, in a meta way. But I digress. Uh, as somebody who is on the inside of this industry and pretty much, uh, you know, doing cutting edge work within this industry, how justified might these fears be? Do you have any anxieties? Not obviously related to your own project because hopefully you're in control of it, but in general, the way AI is going. No, I, I, I don't, and maybe it'll be like one of these things that 10 years from now will be like, you know, that idiot, he said something so stupid. I don't have those fears, not yet, because um, there's a fundamental limiting principle that we have in computer science, and we have not found a way out, and that's giggle. Garbage in, garbage out. Every machine ever built or we still use works with this fundamental principle, which means machines pretty much do what you tell them to do, um, by and large. Um, so, you know, the, there's a very well-known uh, Turing Award-winning computer scientist named Julia. Uh, very, you know, uh, for those of you who remember Daniel Pearl, who was killed in Pakistan, you know, the journalist, his father. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Julia Pearl um, was a very well-known artificial intelligence expert in computer science on the Turing Award in 2014. He's written a fantastic book. Um, and in his book, Julia Pearl um, argues that if you really want to make machines think, uh, what is missing, or has been missing forever, is machines have no way of causal reasoning, of saying, you know, this event happened because of these other things that I did or I thought and so on. We have no way of even having this kind of an interface with a machine today. Machines are not going to say. The best that AI, I mean, it's such a catchphrase, so I don't like it, but the best it can do today is you give it a lot of data you, you can give it a lot of data saying, for example, marks uh, you know, of students in Bangalore versus Delhi for the last hundred years. And maybe it'll, you know, looking at the patterns, it will say, oh, the students in Delhi tend to perform better in these subjects and the students in Bangalore tend to perform better in these subjects. Um, and so when you have a lot of data, you know, we have designed techniques to make sense of the data, to find patterns in the data. But this doesn't tell you anything about why are students in Bangalore better in certain subjects. That is where real intelligence evolves. And we have no way as yet in machines of doing this kind of reasoning. 
So to me, until we find that framework, that language, that connection, I, I, I would not be worried about these kinds of things. Fair enough. You know, last year at some point, I uh, think, I don't know what that bell means. Do we have five more minutes or? Okay, great. Um, okay, so, you know, uh, last year at some point, I think uh, I read somewhere that Bukesh Omani said that you said to him that you intend to disrupt the business that um, it's on record. Uh, uh, that um, <laughs> that uh, your uh, father built, I suppose what you meant was uh, the generation of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs uh, and the, the, the sort of businesses built then using AI algorithm and big data. Anyone who's been paying attention to what you've been saying might, um, I mean, perhaps you said that in half joke, but anyone who's been paying attention might have got a good sense of uh, what you were getting at with that. But I want to ask you a slightly larger question, which is um, on the state of the tech industry in India today, uh, your thoughts on that, um, you know, the development of the global delivery system, in a sense, was one a big innovation, a, a big contribution of the Indian tech industry. Uh, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but uh, in, 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 uh, for the way that software was built, what do you feel might be some of the shortcomings of the way the industry is going today, particularly when it comes to innovation and R&D? I'm nobody to sort of make no, a strong statement are. for the whole industry. No, I'm not. Uh, Any I'm, observations that you'd like to share? But I'll say a couple of things. One is, no, I never made that statement to start with. I think Mr. Ambani is being very kind. In fact, it was the other way around. He said, no, come on, you should be, you should do this, you should, you know, dream bigger and so on. I think it was in that spirit he kind of... There is not a day that passes by in this country without someone or the other accusing some Ambani or the other of lying. Do go. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not accusing him. I'm saying he's being very nice to me. <laughs> saying, no, no, you should dream bigger. Anyway, but um, I, I think the point you made is very important, which does not get enough, India does not get enough credit because I don't think we in India have articulated it well enough, certainly not in the right way and in the right forums. If in the 60s you read computing literature, people would say you want to build more and more complex software, 60s and 70s. The more complex the software, the more people you need, and the more people you have, the closer they have to sit with each other. In fact, often even in the same room with their elbows touching. There's actually literature like this with you know, very well-known computer scientists who believe this. And I would argue that the first time the myth of that closeness, that idea that software is this kind of uh, thing that only a few people who sit in the same room can build, was comprehensively uh, broken and shown to be industrialized and you can build across the globe, was actually done out of India. And that is an extraordinary contribution. That is the global delivery model. And what I find amazing as a computer scientist is almost nobody seems to understand this or know about it. In fact, we Indians ourselves don't talk about it this way. Today we take it for granted. I, I used to be at Microsoft helping build part of Windows uh, Vista back in the day. And what is amazing was in, you know, in Redmond and Seattle we built part of it, Hyderabad would build part of it, Beijing was building part of it. We just took it for granted that software is built this way. But that was not the case <coughs> until about 1981 or so. Um, and and that, to me, is 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 seminal contribution that India made to software that has changed software forever. Now the next question is that's great, but what have we done since then? To my limited understanding, um, I don't yet know of how. Again, I only restrict to software because that's what I understand. How the software world has changed because of India since then, I don't yet know. Um, many Indians who have been very successful. Uh, in business or in academia, they've gone abroad, they've contributed and so on. But out of India, I don't yet know what has been the next kind of big change in the technology industry or in the software industry that has come out of India. I'm not aware of it. Which can mean one of two things. I don't know enough or nothing has happened. One of two. Or a combination. I think the answer is obvious. I had uh, a couple more questions, but we are out of time. I'm just going to plant them in the audience so you can perhaps catch Rohan outside after these sessions and ask them those questions because I at least personally find them very interesting. One is that I mentioned in my introduction that he wrote a thesis uh, for his PhD that ended up becoming subject of policy debate. And it was uh, not exactly on uh, 
uh, you know, what we spoke about this evening and what he's working on right now. In fact, it was on something called white fi, which is, um, uh, well, related to spectrum use. And I feel that it can have a lot of relevance in contemporary India. So I wanted to ask him about that. I also wanted to ask him about the big prediction for 2019, which was also the big prediction for 2018, that there's going to be greater tech regulation, what he feels about that as an industry insider. I'm not getting to ask those questions, but I'm going to end with one final quick question. Sorry, do you want to? No, when you're done, I just want to have, I have a sure. plea, but I'll wait, I'll reserve my plea for you. All right, uh, so one final uh, quick question, which is that you are working, the venture that you're working on is uh, focused on um, AI for deterministic human work, but as somebody who's interested in arts and culture and history, what sort of contribution can AI make in the future for fields that involve creative human decisions? That's your last question. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, uh, what I meant is, it, and I'm okay. Well, no, no, that's that's a very deep question that requires a lot more sort of back and forth. What do you do for uh, what's what are your favorite hobbies? <laughs> I, I take the first one. Uh, no, I, 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 for the first time I went to an, uh, an art exhibition in Tani where every piece of art was generated by new network. Uh, now again, but I have strong reservations about why I think that's interesting. Uh, I just think it's random. But having said that, uh, I think we will find, I don't want to say humanities and so on, I think societally we'll find maybe applications of AI um, oh, you know, having some kind of interesting questions. So, if if a neural network diagnoses you with cancer uh, versus a doctor who does not, you know, what are those implications? There are some additional questions that come up from there um, as well, and so on. So, I think there'll be some kind of interesting things that will happen down the line for sure, which which are not about deterministic or non deterministic, which are just about things we are so used to other humans doing, which machines now. Maybe AI for political leadership. I would definitely um, back that one with uh, all my might. <laughs> all right, I think that's all we have. May I just say one? Yes. Oh, yeah. and the my one request to all of you um, is, you know, this the classical library of India project. You can look it up, murtilibrary.com, M-U-R-T-Y, not T-H-Y. We are a non-profit, <coughs> so I'm not here plugging any for-profit thing or our company, none of these things. Our whole aim here is. I just want to leave you all with a slightly depressing but thought, but hopefully you know, you'll know you all help us do something about it. We're all in the midst of a huge a tsunami of cultural loss. These 14 languages, we estimate, will have 200 to 300 million texts that in the next 100 years, they're going to become you know, like languages invented on Mars. We won't understand them. Um, and our effort, at best, in 100 years, we would have done 500 to 1,000 volumes. That's it. Divide that by 200 to 300 million, we have basically done nothing. Um, and so my request to all of you is this, we need many, many more such efforts like what, like the ones we are doing, or perhaps even better efforts or different efforts. I would request all your help in spreading the word, spreading knowledge about classics, about why people should read Indian classics, why Indian classics can go toe to toe with any classic from any other part of the world. When you celebrate Diwali, uh, or any other festival, please buy these sorts of books, give them to your children, to your friends' children. Uh, discuss these texts with, with your own family members. Uh, ultimately, the only people who will lose uh, if we don't do these things is us Indians, no one else. We can all, I'm sure many of you have read about all the political stuff, about all these things in the papers. I find when we start reading, when we start doing anything about culture in India, it starts becoming political very quickly. The danger in doing that is that the ultimate losers will be us Indians and not be anyone else. And we are already in the midst of this loss. I'm a perfect example of my generation, you know, grew up speaking English, studied computer science, South Indian classes, don't really seem to know much about these languages, and I'm not alone. Um, and I think in my generation, the number of scholars who can read these things are almost next to zero. And so we must be really worried. It's taken us two to three to four thousand years to accumulate this culture, and if this disappears in a hundred years from now, maybe in a hyper-globalized world, we all look the same, feel, eat the same, speak the same language, but then we have no uniqueness. So I really request you all, you know, uh, to take a look at our effort and other efforts like this as well, um, and please take it very seriously and help us. I join you.
Rama in this week. I truly do. It is MCLI is, and um, and this is on record. I, it is the most inspiring project that I have come across. It's truly. Um, I mean, when I first heard about it, when I first saw it, it it, it was one of those life changing moments for me. And I join his plea. Please don't just look up the books and. Uh, they cost almost nothing. They are available online. They are in bookstores. Buy the books, read the books, but also talk about this. Uh, there may be people who are interested. Just just remember to mention it because you never know where one idea goes uh, from just being a spark. Thank you very much for listening and thank you, Rohan, for joining us. Thank you.